Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Okay, let's talk about Nicola Jones Crossley a little bit. I ran into Nicola a few weeks ago, more than that now, over a month ago. And she runs something that is kind of dear to my heart, right? So she runs this little business called Akin Asia. She's Australian. She came here to teach English, looking for something to do, looking for some, you know, to create some value in her life and have purpose. And she started this business that really just tries to help empower women and, and help empower women founders, create a community around, you know, having women connect to each other and then literally like having a purpose. And I, I'm amazed, you know, mm. I'll talk a little bit about this later, but, you know, charisma, and I'll say it again and I'll keep saying it like until the day I die. It's like one of those things you can't buy and you can't teach, you either have it or you don't. And she has it. Mm. And I don't think she's 100% aware of it either. Because the way she uses it is in a way that's so natural. She just walked into, I will call it a room, but she sat down at a table. There were 15 other people, and she just took over. Hmm. right? And she was neither the oldest person there nor the most experienced person there, and she just took it over. As soon as she showed up, everybody just started paying attention, and she just went to work. So what is this? Well, she runs, like I said, she runs this group called Akinasia, and every other Tuesday they have this thing called the Bangkok Breakfast Network. Okay, and the Bangkok Breakfast Network is really meant to be a place where sort of women can meet, right, Mm -hmm. and they get together and try to exchange ideas. I mean, the whole philosophy is that it's trying to strengthen a community and facilitate further connections, right? So it's trying to be this sort of viral connectivity thing. And it's just an event where people can come before work. We met at 8 o'clock this morning, and all these women who are there, professional women, come together, have some coffee, have some breakfast, and just meet each other. And try to figure out ways that they can help each other, you know, in the same way that men have been doing in clubs for mm. centuries. True. Right? And I'll tell you what, I was super impressed with the group of people there. And there were women there representing media, you know, NGOs, so non government organizations. There was a woman who, with her husband, started a marketing and design studio. And then there were some startup founders as well. And, the, you know, I was the only man that was there alone, right? Because the other guy basically came with his wife. And they were working on a business together. And it's not their business isn't a startup, right? It's a design studio that's been built in Myanmar and the rest of Southeast Asia for years. And they just decided to move to Bangkok because they started to see some of their client base do the same thing. Mm. But when I started talking, I I went last. Actually, the the Breakfast Club or the network actually features one woman every other week who's kind of the center of it. And I'll talk about this woman as well. But she wasn't the founder for a company. But as soon as I said that I did venture capital investing, that I did a podcast that, you know, called the Asian Tech Podcast, a couple of the women that were there that were founders, just they were very interested in who I was and what I did. And I happened to sit next to this woman named Blair Cadet. Blair's from Massachusetts. She's 27 years old. And she had literally bounced a little bit back and forth. She teaches English as well. And she bounced back and forth between Bangkok and China and just decided that for her, she liked living here better. But she's actually building a business called Healthy Hair Asia. So she's a founder, and like in the true sense of the word. Mm. Her concept is that, you know, she looked around, and there are plenty of businesses for women when it comes to, you know, face cream and all these things, skincare products, right? But very little, if any, for what she likes to call modern hair care products. And maybe to you and me that doesn't sound so interesting, you know, but her target audience is women between the ages of like 22 and 35, and for them, the hair care products are really important. They just don't focus on it because, frankly, the big companies like you know, P&G um, and Unilever and big companies like that, they don't focus on the same type of market that she does. Like She's making her own products. She imports a little bit, but mostly she's making her own products, mm. right? And she's making them in a healthy way. So if you look at her website, just healthyhairasia.com, you know, she has a hair rinse that's made from... I can't even see the ingredients, but it's like mangoes and papaya, like really healthy ingredients, aloe vera, green tea, hair rinse, all these types of things, right? And she she actually made a decision which I thought was really interesting, right? So, and these are her words, not mine, right? So just bear with me on this, right? But she's a black lady. And she said when she was growing up, she was tired of seeing other black women who were using chemicals to tease their hair straight. And she just, her her hair was long actually, right? And it was slightly braided. But she told me, she said, I made a decision that I was going to let my hair be natural, but I didn't know how to do it properly. 
right? Because even in the United States, the products for doing that aren't so advanced. And when I moved out to Asia, I had nothing, I had no products to buy for myself. And I was continuously testing it. And she's now come up with a way to sort of combine natural ingredients to make modern hair care products for women, not just for herself, but for all types of hair. It's just, it doesn't sound like a fascinating business maybe, but to me it was great that she's like, like you said earlier, she's found her passion, it makes her heart beat faster, right? And she's doing this. Now the other thing, the other part of her concept is that she wants to also build a female dominated logistics company. Now why is that? Well, if women are going to be the engine that drives e-commerce growth in Southeast Asia, and if her products are being targeted towards women and bought by women, she wants them delivered by women as well. And now she told me this, like her business hasn't scaled yet, but she said she gets an incredible response when someone orders a product from her, she either makes it or has an inventory, and she goes and actually delivers it herself. Mm. Now, we, she and I were talking, this does not scale at any level. And she knows that, which is why she's thinking about building a logistics company on top of this. But she made this great point. When she shows up at the door and says, I'm actually Blair, I made this product, the people say, she told me, want to take selfies with her. Yeah, that's awesome. They, they want to take a picture with her because they want to be involved, right? Right. So, yeah, they feel part of that experience, right? Because the founder is there and it's not some big corporation which is outsourcing the whole thing, right? Nope, it's her. And she said to me, it was great at breakfast this morning. She's like, I want to replicate myself. I want to hire a bunch of people like I am and replicate yeah. myself. And I just looked, I was, shaking, I was shaking my head and saying, okay, that's impossible. But first of all, just finding somebody with the same level of interest, much less the same level of passion. And, you know, just the same desire is so hard to do. But she stopped me. She said, no, no, no. When I say replicate myself, I mean just someone who's going to show up at their door who's also a lady and who's happy and who's smiling and who supports the product. And right. she kind of she kind of won me over. Yeah. That's possible. Because there's plenty of people like that, right? And with a good organization, that can work. Yeah, and to be fair, that's not a new business model, right? Yeah. Whether it's Avon or Tupperware, you know, or any company like that. But the difference is that those Avon product Avon products were manufactured. Tupperware was obviously manufactured. She's building this herself and she's also running the entire logistics too. So I just thought it was an interesting way for her to work on her passion yeah. and grow this stuff. So I'm going to meet her again, right? Because I want to, I want to learn more. And I believe, right, that in e-commerce, if you, if you have a differentiated product, now you have a potential business. Now the question for her and I to discuss, and we're going to talk to each other, I believe it's Thursday, is how can you get this thing to scale and how can you get to scale faster, right? And yeah. we talked, even at breakfast, you can see, right, remember, this is 8 o'clock in the morning, and it was funny, right? So I spent my whole life, and I know I talk about this too much, like waking up at five, getting to the office at six, and like, you know, working until seven o'clock at night. I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying, wow, I can't believe I did that. But even the ladies that were there this morning and the guy that was there too, they were like, what are we doing at eight o'clock in the morning, <laughs> sitting in a restaurant, having coffee and breakfast? Exactly. And I just thought, oh my God, this is so easy. But it was just more funny. Everyone has their own life experience, right? Well, isn't this interesting though, Michael, in the context of last week's conversation when we were talking about automating the whole logistics thing, you know, like yeah. replacing yeah. humans with robots, where yeah. here's somebody who's going the other way and saying, okay, you right, if, you, if you guys are going to outsource the thing, if you guys are going to turn it into robots, we're going to turn this into the most personal human experience you're ever going to have. And that's going to win people over. It's kind of like McDonald's versus Starbucks in the two models, isn't it? Right. The machine versus the human experience. I know you're not big on Starbucks, but. There we go. <laughs> There's no, but remember, you, you and I were on different sides of this, um, on this um, argument last week. Like, I strongly believe that people want to deal with other people. Yeah. And you said, I don't care. I just want, I just want it to get to my house on time and easy to pay for. Well, for something like this, where somebody's making a conscious choice. Right. And for the kind of products like Healthy Hair Asia, she's, she's going after a market which has a clear identity of who they are and what they're not, right? So maybe yeah, yeah. that... You know, the weakest link in the whole of that thing is the person who knocks at the door and hands that thing over to them, right? That's we the, always that's talk about this. Exactly. So that, you know, to turn that into an advantage, it's fantastic. Because we always, you know, people are always outsourcing customer service to India, right? That's been the trend for the last 20 years. But if you or can anywhere, come, yep, yep. Exactly, or Philippines or wherever. But if you can turn right. that on its head and, make, you know, like Zappos have done, we talked about this last week, how they turn customer service into the best marketing strategy out there, right? 
Yes. Maybe this could be it. Maybe this is how it can scale is word of mouth. You know, people doing the selfies with Blair at the door and the, the, all the sort of like the next generation of Blairs that she can hire, right? I mean, that would be awesome. Exactly. And I just like the – look, we talked about it a little bit this morning and not a lot. And I was actually – it was actually interesting to me that it didn't feel like I was sitting at breakfast with a bunch of women who were lamenting the fact that they were females in a male world. Like there was none yeah. of that this morning. And that's kind of what I expected, which I think is fair, right? No, nope, and that's fair. That's, that's what you've bias, been used right? to, right? I mean, that's what we've well, seen a lot of. It's just my bias, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's funny, like, women that are already empowered feel very strong about the, not having the necessity to say, you know, we're being slightly repressed, even if they feel like they are. It was a really incredible group of people. And these yeah. were just regular ladies. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just, I felt kind of privileged to be there. But this has been a lifelong thing for me. You know, I joked a little bit about this at breakfast this morning when I was introducing myself. You know, it's a historical accident that I was born in the United States of America, that I speak English, that I'm Caucasian, and that I'm a guy. <laughs> like, I kind of have every possible benefit. You, you won all the lottery stakes there, didn't you? Well, I was short, so I didn't win everything, but I won more. Well, I mean, I'm checking, checking the demographic box at least, right? <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. I'm convinced if I were six foot two, I'd be a lot more successful. But then, <laughs> exactly. Maybe, well, they say talent is the great equalizer, right? So there you go. It is. The internet makes me feel taller. Um, <laughs> anyway, I just the whole point of the whole point of this is just to talk about female founders. I thought she was really, really interesting, um, and she's just getting on her way. And I want to figure out a way, of, if I can, to try to help her and support her, and so, to see how I can. Um, do that go ahead those two examples that you shared i mean they're great examples you've got that nicola jones crossley from akinasia and blair cadet from healthy yep. hair asia you know what's interesting about this i don't know if it's something specific to that kind of founder you know and i think that I, I really love these businesses which focus on what i call usefulness rather than innovation oh uh, sure you know you you can you, i think there's a lot of bias there's a lot of pressure for founders to be, you know, super innovative, to be the next Mark Zuckerberg, to be the next game changer. But there's, you know, there is a ton of money and success to be had from just being useful, solving problems that people have on an everyday basis. And these, you know, these two ladies are doing, building very useful businesses, right? And I look at those and think, fantastic, love it. You know, I think that those are the kind of role models, not just for women entrepreneurs, but for men as well. Yeah, I mean, I was listening to a podcast this morning, so starting last night, but finishing this morning of um, Kara Swisher, you know, yeah. from Recode Decode, and she was interviewing Kevin Systrom, right, the founder and the, really like the main guy at um, at Instagram, and he said, you know, he just he he is brilliant, by the way. If you listen to this man talk, completely yeah. brilliant, um, and you know, he said one of their rules at Instagram is, and this just gets back to what you were just talking about, is don't come in and pitch a, an idea to me just because it's cool to do and that you think people will like it. I want to know what problem your product is solving, even in a company like Instagram. In other words, yeah. when someone said, I want to come do stories, we thought about it a lot, but it has to pass that test of what problem is it solving, which gets back to what you said. What's its usefulness? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like, a great question to ask. Yeah. I loved it. And I try to use all those little things, right? When I hear really brilliant people talk, I don't, and you, we'll get back to giving people credit later because it's going to end up being quite funny. Um, I'm always happy to, you know, to attribute credit where it's due, but I like to learn from other people. We talked about this this morning too at, at breakfast, and that is, you know, maybe the more experienced you get, the more you realize there's so much stuff you don't know. Yeah. And the happier you are when you learn something from somebody who's smarter than you are. It's a kind of trite, but we mm. used to say at work, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ain't that true, right? I mean... It is, though. Yeah. I mean, if you're just it, there for the, the paycheck, then, well, that ain't a problem, right? So No, but you know what I mean, right? Like, yeah, in yeah. The, the, theoretically, if you're in a room with people that are not as smart as you, yeah, yeah. and you know that, you're doing something wrong because you're not going to learn anything, and frankly, their experience is not going to be great either. Anyway... You, there's no way to talk about and this and this gets really interesting and gives context as well. I, I think there's no realistic way to talk about female founders um, in the tech startup space in Southeast Asia without talking about Alexis Horowitz Burdick. Mm. And for a bunch of reasons. One is 
Um, just to give context to the whole discussion. So Alexis, back in 2011, after trying a couple of different startups and basically coming to Asia as a consultant, um, founded a company called Luxola. So, you know, skin products, uh, cosmetic products for women, all at the high end, get exclusive products and try to distribute them online. And she was one of the earliest and most prominent and well-known female founders and, and, and just basic entrepreneurs in Singapore. And she was starting to get tired even back in 2012 and 2013. And that in – it's like dog years ago, right? It's mm. so long ago. Even though it's only four years ago. But they introduced her at the first Tech in Asia con I mean, um, conference that I attended. And they said, you know, we'd like to introduce, you know, Alexis – She's the most famous female founder in Singapore and blah, blah, blah. And she just got up on stage and went like that. And you, she's an incredible lady in her own right. I'm um, very powerful, which makes her, you know, very interesting. And she said, okay, from now on, I'm not a female founder. Mm -hmm. I'm just a founder, right? I'm not a female entrepreneur. I'm just an entrepreneur. I'm sick and tired of being right. categorized as a female. You, you know, no one ever gets up here as a male entrepreneur. Yeah. Right. No one. She says no one. And I don't know if she said this, but the implication was, you know, no one's ever an Israeli entrepreneur. No one's ever an Indian entrepreneur. Why am I a female? I'm just an entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even back then, she was saying that. But I don't think we've made. Frankly, the reason why I want to have this conversation is because I don't think we've made much progress. Not just in the region, but globally. Right. Look at your top five founders in the United States. Whether it's you know Instagram. We just talked about Kevin Systrom, a great guy, really concerned about community, not his yeah, problem. Yeah. It's a guy, right? Zuckerberg, um, look at the Twitter. Two guys built Twitter, Airbnb, two more men. Like, it's all men. Yeah. You, can, you can argue about why that's the case, but it is the case, right? Anyway, I started thinking about Alexis, and then I started going through my mind really quickly. And I wanted to spend some time talking about, I mean, I had a list of six or seven, but I really think we're going to have to do, like, another one of these, maybe like we did for autonomous vehicles. Let's do it. Yeah, I think we'll have to do two, and because I know you have a bunch of ladies that you'd like to talk about as well. Yeah, but I'd like to get through at least two of them, right? And I think they're both really significant in their own right, but in combination, I think they make a really strong point about what's been happening at least during my five or six years living in Thailand. Awesome. Now, before you bring those people in, just on that Go point ahead. about, I know I think what Alexis said at that conference was awesome. See, mm. you know, the elephant in the room really wasn't it that. They don't want to be there because they're a woman, right? They don't want nope. to be the token woman entrepreneur making the numbers up, right? Nope. And, and, you know, we've got to kind of change langu language, you know, thought changes with language and changing it by not calling them a female entrepreneur as a starting point, right? Agreed. And I know you talk about the US as well. There ain't a lot of case studies out there, right? I mean, I know, for example, well, you know, there's Sheryl Sandberg, but, you know, she got in there. She's not a founder. Exactly. Yeah. And she, you know, that was a connection as well, family connection, all that kind of thing. And then... I mean, everybody talks about people like Michelle Obama being the next president, but, you know, she's the wife of a former right. president, right? You know, and right. it's the same with Hillary Clinton. So, you know, the, the, the role models outside of Asia, you know, we're not that advanced really outside of Asia either, are we? So, you know, it's no. kind of, you know, so well, I just kind we, of think, we, you know. We may be better off here. Like you and I talk about this. We can see the future. Maybe we are the future already here. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, you just said what I was going to say. I mean, we talked one, I think one of our earlier stories, we talked about how many billionaire Chinese entrepreneurs were female, right? You know, and right. I think the mo there's more female billionaires in China than there is any other country in the world. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know. You could put it all together, but make your own assumptions. But I think, you know, to sort of get on the perch and say, well, Asia's behind in terms of women's equality well maybe it is in sort of like you know traditional areas but when it comes to the startup scene there's a lot of interesting things going on right there, there really are and i want to point out one more thing so not only did alexis kick ass excuse my language um and build a business that was operating in four or five of the southeast east asian countries she was one of the first people to build an e-commerce business that then expanded into the rest of the region people don't talk about this anymore but she was also one of the first founders in Southeast Asia to sell her company, right? To yeah. exit, real proper exit, to one of the biggest luxury brands in the world. Like no one talks about it, but we've all heard of LVMH. Yeah, exactly. And their Sephora brand brought, bought Luxola. And not only did they buy that company, but they installed her as the CEO of their digital business. Yeah. No one talks about it anymore. It just happened like in 2015 and now it's over, but it shouldn't be over. She's amazing. Don't they always, they always sort of look at people like that and then they say, oh, what are you doing for 
women in your situation they all sort of there's there's a little bit of I don't know if it's resentment, but that's the problem, isn't it? I don't think these people have to do anything. They, the, the greatest thing they offer is their story, isn't it? That's Absolutely. the most powerful thing. Rather than saying, all right, I'm now going to go and put it all, give it all back to women. Just by being there and being an example, she will empower thousands, millions of women to do sure. similar, right? Sure. I don't necessarily believe, as you say, that, it, that she's obliged to help every woman who comes to her for assistance. I don't think she's obliged to. I think she's there to encourage them and to be, like you said, a role model, right? Um, in the in the same way that you know there are male role models for for me and for you in your country and in mine and just in the world, but they should not do me any favors just because I'm also a guy. Exactly. Right. So who else do you know? What other role models, case studies, stories do you know? <laughs> Well, so I'm sitting around at breakfast this morning and I'm racking my brains, right? Because I want to, I'm sitting next to Blair and I want to be able to at, at least give her a little bit of not just guidance, but again, perspective. And I remember one of the first ladies that I met here when I walked into the Echelon conference in Thailand. It must have been in 2012. I cannot remember. Could have been 2013. Um, was a woman named Nikki Surapaitun, right? And Nikki, if I've mispronounced your, your last name, please forgive me. Tweet me. Tell me. Make fun of me. It's all good, right? And Nikki's really been prolific in her ability to, um, to found businesses and just to participate in the founding of businesses, right? And she's, if you meet her, she's like a typical founder, male, female, it doesn't matter. She is filled with energy and her energy is contagious and it just never ends. You follow her. It's, mm. What's the word? Parapiatic? Like, I don't even know if that's the right word, but you know what I mean. It's just like constant energy yeah anyway she was one of the first people i met and you know as a as a foreigner she was just skeptic she was skeptical of me i remember she was like like who are you what are you doing here why do i even really need to talk to you and i kind of like that attitude of just like <laughs> i'm way better than you you're not even in your home country and don't even come over and talk to me because i've done more stuff in like the last two years than you've done in your whole life right but she doesn't know either but let's let's just run through some of the things that she's done and she's a founder in like the pure sense of the word right so when i first met nikki she was working on this business that was trying to disrupt sort of the tickets and the gds the global distribution system business in southeast asia on what i'll call call low-cost travel outside of airlines so buses ferries and trains okay mm -hmm. so she helped start that business and as soon as that got going um, and, and let's be fair, before she did that, she went to pharmacy, you know, she went to university to study like pharmacology, I guess. Hmm. Okay. And with no help from anybody, she started a chain, not one, but a chain of pharmacies. So like, like bricks and mortar stores in multiple places in Bangkok, um, I believe targeting foreigners hmm. and I, cause Nikki does speak English and I've heard her publicly speak. She's great. Um, and she then sold that to a larger chain. But just think about that. Like that's that was her introduction to building a business offline. Yeah. Okay. The hustle. And she learned. She that. was. She's amazing. Like you've got to see her. She never stops. Right. Yeah. Um, and she inspires other people around her too, and doesn't give like favors out per se, but just expects from other people the same thing that she gives. Um, and again, we forget this, but back in 2013 or 14, Rocket Internet, right, was the bane of everybody's existence. And there was a company founded in Brazil called Easy Taxi, yeah. which was kind of modeled off of Uber, I'm guessing. Um, and the big news back then was that Uber was, I mean, not Uber, but that Easy Taxi had raised $40 million, which is a lot of money, and was expanding into Southeast Asia, right? So it was a siren call for the rest of the region saying, Rocket's coming in with another copycat business that was built in another place and just gonna come in and dominate in that space. And it was scary back then. Remember Grab at the time was Grab Taxi and it was smaller, less well known, and nobody wanted to work for them, at least at the time, because nobody knew who they were, right? So the rocket business called Easy Taxi was the place to be. They hired a guy named um, Felipe Kosinski and Felipe went out immediately and as his COO and kind of co-founder hired Nikki and plenty of other people that were available for that job, but in his mind, and I know Felipe really well as well, he's a hardworking, sort of deliberate, thoughtful, detail-oriented guy, and she, coupled with him, made a really strong team, and I was thinking about this today, too. That business failed in, um, in Thailand, and frankly, it failed in Southeast Asia, and sometimes it's not the, man the local management team's fault that that business failed. Mm. I watched this very closely, 
that that business and one of the things that made Grab so successful was that they really localized the concept. They understood how to talk to the taxi drivers. They understood how to talk to the taxi dispatchers. Every country was different. And in some cases, every company was different. Nikki knew that, right? And Nikki frequently during the time that she was working for Grab, you can ask her this, actually flew to Brazil, I believe, Sao Paulo, to talk to the founders and talk about strategy and stuff. And my guess, although she hasn't said this to me directly and neither has Felipe, is that there was probably some frustration with that business that was partially being managed from literally halfway around the world, or I guess yeah. you'd say all the way around the other side of the world, you know, just do what we're doing here. It's going to exactly. work there. It works everywhere. And I think, you know, as a, as a woman who was very strong willed, right. And has a strong opinion. She just said like, this is un, untenable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she decided to move on to something else. But again, she didn't go work for somebody else. Okay. There was a business called Delivery, which was an Arden Capital and Inspire Ventures funded business. And the idea was, you know, logistics, things in Thailand, things in the whole region need to get delivered, not just things that you've bought per se, right? But if you have an old couch and you have to send it to your sister's house, it's got to get there somehow and you don't want to do it. So Delivery would deliver packages, parcels, and anything that needed to get delivered. I remember back then, there were none of these um, – shopping specific logistics companies, right? Like Lala Move and companies like that that were going on doing that. So Delivery was one of the first companies that was doing that, Built literally built up the team and then was um, headhunted to a company called Send It. Again, was the country head there, and I don't want to keep talking about her, but like at every place she went, she was the founder or co-founder, and now she's the country head um, for a company called Tap Commerce. And to be fair, along the way, as we talked about, she hasn't like helped female founders per se, mm. but you know that she's been a role model. I know she's been a role model because people talk to me about her all the time. She is like a very prominent person in the startup scene, not just in Thailand, but in the whole region. And she travels the world, right? Mm. The company right now for whom she is the local co-founder is a European-based company. I'm just saying she's amazing. I can't say enough great things about her. And she never stops. And even in great in a time of great frustration, I like working with people and watching people work that are happy regardless. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying she ignores the fact or doesn't understand that there are challenges, but even within that challenging environment, it's just she must be a great person to work with because she's always positive. And I think that's really useful as a leader and a founder. Sounds amazing. Sounds amazing. I don't know the full story, but obviously you know her better than I do. I, I read about her that she comes from some small rural province out in <laughs> yeah. Thailand. She's not like from some... No. I mean, there's, there's a big sort of wealthy, upper-class elite in Bangkok, isn't there? She's not from that group of people. And those are the no. kind of people who are sort of foreign-educated, international school, all that kind of thing. But yep. she's come from yep. some like rural province, which makes just even more interesting, the whole story, right? It's great. She's come from Konkan, right? So, and again, her, you know, her family is not, is not an unsophisticated family, but you're right. They're not the landed gentry in Bangkok. And it's so hard. So think about it. She comes from the countryside, right? So in America, it's like being, and please, Nikki, forgive me if this is the wrong. Oh, um, uh, you're going to say it. <laughs> You're going well, to piss some people off, say it. I'm going to piss somebody off, but it's like being, <laughs> I did this to somebody in Japan once, and they never forgave me. Like, <laughs> never. They were from Kagoshima, yeah? All right. And I'm like, oh, that's like being, that's like being from Louisiana. And she was like, no, it's yeah. not actually like being from Louisiana at all. Nothing against Louisiana for people that like Louisiana. All right, let's get yourself out of this hole. Anyway, so it's like being from um, Kentucky. But anyway, but you're right. She wasn't from the landed gentry, but she came here anyway and still succeeded and continues to succeed. And I think that's awesome because it's awesome. not easy to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Need more of those. Yeah, way more of those. Yeah. Way more. And there are, they, they're out there, aren't they? I mean, it's just that I think they don't, they don't get the highlight. They don't get the spotlight that men. I mean, you know, you're talking about having role models that you and I could turn to. We've got millions you know we can cherry pick who the hell we like when it comes to role models right but for women it's kind of well you've got to be a bit more selective haven't you because there ain't a lot out there i don't know what it is it's just maybe the media isn't giving them the coverage or what i don't know but that's what we're doing here now we're giving these people a chance a platform to get their stories out there right yeah that's the whole idea and i think it's uh, yeah i think it's a it's a great thing to do and and i want to sort of empower them to do that themselves we can talk about that later but i have ideas um 
Yeah. So I, I think she's amazing. And I think it dovetails nicely into kind of the next lady that I'd like to talk to. And we can talk about her journey because this one, um, this one's really close to me because I've known Shannon Kalyana mid for a long time. And with her, it's like what you see is not what you get. It's hard to explain the significance of that, but it's also difficult to explain the impact that she's had on just so many aspects of the startup ecosystem in Southeast Asia. And this is a lady who is in a continuous mode of giving back. Mm -hmm. So even while she's founding a startup, having the vision to do things, which we'll talk about um, later, that other women and men, frankly, don't have the vision to do, um, she's also arranging charity events um, like constantly and using whatever resources she has, she has to help other people. And you know, when I first met her, and it surprised me, she wasn't doing so much like public speaking, which means you know, sitting up on stage and participating in panels and stuff. But she's completely nailed that as well. It's just another weapon she has in her arsenal, which just makes her really, really powerful and very, very com um, compelling. And you know, again, I like when I talk about Shannon, it's hard for me to talk about it in a way that's distant just because I know her so well. I know her um, her family really well. And we can get to that in a bit too. But I don't want to minimize the impact that other female female founders like Nikki has had, like Alexis has had. It's just that I know Shannon really well. So I can see like on a day to day basis her efforts, her struggles, like all the successes and frankly some of the failures and all the accomplishments that she's had, but I've seen them up close, like mm -hmm. and, and personally. And you can argue with um, terminology with me, but I don't use this word lightly. I think she's a, a visionary. And at the beginning of this conversation, we talked about charisma, right? And one of the things that charisma gives you for free is just a talent for convincing others that whatever your idea and your vision is, is, is correct and compelling. Mm. And other people should participate. And, you know, where a normal person literally has to sit down and have, you know, a pros and cons and just have a bullet point list of things that convince other people to, to come with them. She just has this charisma that says, um, you got to come do this with me. I've thought it through. She's got this in spades, mm. right? People just follow like that's She's like a natural born leader. And again, I think when I met her, she wouldn't have said that to you, but she's really figured it out. And that's a compliment, if, even if it doesn't sound like one. So she's listening. That, that, that's a compliment for sure. Again, just another weapon in her arsenal. That ability to convince people that the vision is viable is really powerful. And the kind of charisma that she has, as I said earlier, you can't buy it and you can't teach it. So what does Shannon Kaliana Mitter do? So what did she do? Well, so before I had met her, she... Um, had worked at Lehman Brothers, um, working on you know some of, building some of their most complex products in Southeast Asia, and she was also involved and hired as a consultant with her partner Paul Van Isle to help build um, one of the first digital tertiary television stations in in Thailand. So a big budget, big um, big project that actually came to fruition and launched. And I forget what the name of that TV station is. And you you and I say this about me all the time. I don't watch that much television. Mm. It's not so iconic I, media. Or... No, 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 no. After no, that. no. It's local. It's like TV uh, seven. I can't remember what it is. Or Thai, Tarat. I can't remember what it is. But a Thai person would know what it was. I just, sorry, I haven't, I, I don't remember. <laughs> um, but after doing that, you know, she kind of looked around and said, what's happening? What's happening in the region and what can I do? What's my vision? Okay, so she came up with this idea to start a business um, called Moxie. Okay, and Moxie was the venture that she was building when I first met her. And this, this was like her baby. And she convinced her consulting partner at the time, this was a guy named Paul Van Isle, um, that they were going to start a lifestyle and media business, right? that it had a big e-commerce component to it and it was focused on women, hmm. right? So you can see like it, this whole concept coming full circle. And the idea was that, you know, women as they are everywhere in the world, um, they run the purse strings in the house and they're also more likely to be shopping online. And definitely that was true statistically back when she started this in Southeast Asia, right? So Moxie was a brand targeting women and she wanted to build a blog around it. And because she'd been involved in media as well, she thought that there was a way to build some media around not just the, the printed word and the written word, 
but by the spoken word as well. And it was something that she used to talk about a lot. So blogging, female products, and just a whole lifestyle site for women. Now, just like we talked about with um, Blair at the beginning of this conversation, they also realized that there was a logistics problem back then. This was in 2013. Okay. And this was before companies like e-commerce and Anchanto and even SingPost had figured out that it was really necessary to build a e-commerce facilitation business on the logistics side. So they were ahead of their time here. And they built together a business called Nikos. So they were running a business called Moxie and a, build, a business called Nikos. And they actually used Nikos to outsource um, the delivery and logistics for some other companies as well. So they were doing two things. One, they were testing their own process on their own product, which was Moxie, and trying to sort of generate sales and then use their own logistics to do that. Remember, this is all her vision. Mm. Right? It's very complicated. <laughs> and I would say well ahead of its time. Um, and then they also built that e-commerce site um, also. Now, they were early. And that vision, unfortunately, did not get to play out under the Moxie moniker. But to be fair, and I was working on them, I was working on this with them back in 2014. Um, you know, as, as happens a lot with startup companies, you go out to raise money. And you get interest, you get no interest, whatever it is. But someone's always out there going, hmm, if you're going to raise money, why not just merge with us? And Shannon was actually a big believer back then. These are her words, not mine, in consolidation in the e-commerce space. And she had actually started working with some other e-commerce sites there. Her idea was, look, we're small in relative terms. Lazada's really big, and they're getting much bigger. And actually, I should back up. She and her partner, Paul, were hired as the consulting company to, to come up with the concept for Lazada as a business. Mm. They hired in two months, I believe, she said they hired the first 160 people into that business. So they knew this really well. They knew who the biggest competition was, and they went out to compete in a, in a smaller space against them. Um, but she figured out that size mattered, and she was trying to work something in the consolidation space, and that didn't happen so well. But what ended up happening was when they went to somebody for an investment, they turned it around and said, why don't we buy you? Hmm. And then the negotiations for the purchase of Moxie actually happened by an ardent capital company called What's New. And the really interesting thing, and this is, again, the power of Shannon, is that you know they had the, the What's New business had their whole team. They had slightly started to expand into Indonesia as well, which was always part of the vision for the Moxie business. Um, but they had a lot of overlap. The only employee at the senior level that they kept from Moxie was Shannon. Okay, so they did buy that business. They combined it. They took the name of that business as well. So they called it Moxie. They eliminated the what's new moniker. And then, again, because of consolidation, I forget actually now, maybe it was Bilna. It might have been Bilna in Indonesia. But they merged with that company too. And it just got too confusing, right? It was like having a hyphenated last name. Mm -hmm third generation right so you have like 16 last names which i always found funny but anyway so they finally changed that business name to orami and you know she's been helping build that business in four different countries for the past um three years now and just last week she announced that she was this was big news actually in the region she announced that she was retiring from that business <clears throat> and looking for a new thing to do. So that's not proprietary information. It was reported by Tech in Asia. It was reported by E27. So everyone knows this. I'm actually really interested to see what she'll do next because in the context of running Orami, which was the old Moxie, right? It was just a merge entity. Um, she became even more famous because she traveled to Korea. She traveled to Japan. She traveled to Indonesia and Malaysia and Vietnam. Like she traveled all over the place and she combined this newfound um, skill of public speaking and sitting on panels to not only talk about e-commerce and marketing, but also to talk about women's places in the startup world. And she became very, I wouldn't say vociferous, but very prominent as well in doing that. And having that transformation take place from essentially the first time I met her back in 2013 to 2017 has been amazing um, to watch. Okay, but again, the female founder as a as a role model 
she's really embraced this, right? And again, like just like Nikki and just like other some of the other ladies that we'll talk about later, you know, she doesn't give away things to other women for free. She expects the same level of commitment and dedication from everybody that works with her and works for her. And believe me, she kicks a serious ass. Remember, this is a woman that also has a family, okay? During the entire time she was doing this, she was also giving birth to twins wow. and, raising, and raising a family. She calls them, besides calling them my little monkeys, she calls them my startup babies. So she literally, and, and this is public, right? So I'm not saying anything that most people don't know, but she'll publish pictures of her kids on Instagram reading like the lean startup. <laughs> You know, they're only two and a half years old, so they're not really reading it, but just holding the books. It's really cute. These two little girls reading, like, The Lean Startup or, like, you oh, know, wow. how to get funded or stuff like that. But, again, she's, and she always says, like, I want to get them started early. Two little girls, by the way, which is great, right? Beautiful. It's interesting, all these stories. I wonder if there's any, there's any sort of uh, um, similarity between these stories, Michael, in the sense that if you look back through these stories, you've got Nicola from Akinasia. Blair, Cadet, Alexis Horowitz, Burdick from Luxola, Nikki uh, from Tap Commerce and from Easy Taxi, etc. And then you've got Shannon, mm -hmm. Oromi. And looking into their backgrounds, some of the things that you said about them already, there seems to be a theme there. I wonder if it's, is this something specific to female entrepreneurs or is something entrepreneurs in generally, but they all have either and I don't know if I'm overstepping the mark here, but they're all of either come from what they would call themselves third culture family. So they, you know, lived abroad, exposed to different cultures, or they were foreigners stroke immigrants themselves. Yep. And that seems to be a common vibe in all of these stories. They've come from the outside, in, outside into a new territory and they've established themselves there and they brought with them something that wasn't in that territory already. I don't know if that's an entrepreneur thing or it seems to be a common thread in all of these female entrepreneurs. What do you think about that? I, I think it's both. And I think if you live your life in a constant challenge, right? I always say this, right? When you meet somebody in their 30s and their 40s, you always presume that the person you're meeting is the person that they've always been. Exactly. Right? That whatever stature they have or have lost or whatever you know, feeling or confidence or anything that they're exposing to you is something that they, they, that they were born with. And I think the reality is well more nuanced, right? So there are a whole bunch of details. And I'm interested, as you know, in storytelling. And one of the stories that I like to tell is the backstory, mm. right? So you don't know what it was like in Alexis's house when she was a kid. You don't know, like, you know, that Shannon was born in Seattle. Like, you don't know what Nikki's family was like in Con Ken, right? And, you know, if I just said to you, Blair, you wouldn't know that her family was black and that she grew up in a small town outside of Boston. Like, you don't know. You'd, and each one of them, you're right, had has their own individual struggles and their own things that they needed to overcome. And I think that if you live a life like that, where it's not like a constant challenge, but you've been able to see challenges and overcome them on a regular basis that you're going to gravitate more towards doing this startup thing and frankly excelling at it because it's something you've been doing i don't want to say passively but without really thinking about it for most of your life right and now you have like an outlet for it and a platform that you've been building over time and here's the outlet for it remember timing is is key to everything a, a woman actually said this to me at morgan's Morgan Stanley, right? We were walking to the elevator. She's like, yeah, timing's everything. Um, but timing's really important because if any of them had tried to do this, and, you know, Nikki had a bunch of startups beforehand. Um, Nicola, who also goes by Nikki, so it's confusing. Let's call her Nicola. Tried a couple of things before um, Akinasia. Um, and I know Shannon tried multiple things before she hit on this thing with Moxie. It's like the, the persistence and the desire, like, to never give up is something that you just build up over time. Mm. And you're just happy to fail. Like people that are happy to fail are way more likely to succeed because the failure doesn't get in their way of just like moving forward. Was well, that thing, isn't it, that they've lived somewhere else and they've moved to a different country or a different city in their life. That's, that's the passive learning about failure, isn't it, that they picked up at a young age. Yep. It's like yep. now, now they don't have all that kind of comfort built around them. Now they're sort of out there a bit more vulnerable and they just have to kind of learn to get comfortable in with being uncomfortable, if you like. And that's a sort of a nece necessary skill for being an entrepreneur, isn't it? It's almost like the, the streetwise skills that they don't 
always teach you in a corporate accelerator, right? And they're kind of, you know, I'm, I'm really fascinated by these stories and I'm really attracted to them in the sense that spiritually, I think they're more in line with the kind of entrepreneurs that I think I am, you know, a bit of a hustler. Whereas yep. there's another t- there's another story of entrepreneurs out there, and I'm not saying it's any better or worse, but there's it's, it's more of a dominant narrative, isn't it, in the media of the guy who goes to Stanford, does the computer science degree, comes right. out with his, you know, goes, raises 50k in the first round, or is his seed fund in the corporate accelerator, all that kind of nonsense without with just an idea, you know, he's still sort of walking around in his flip flops and his shorts, right? So that's sort of what we're kind of familiar with. I don't know if this is fundamentally different but it seems to be uh, to me a different type of entrepreneur at least right and that the kind of stories i think that kind of get left behind or missed out in that whole sort of big startup movement and all the kind of the hype associated with it right yeah i mean look the myth of the geek founder right who started his business in a dorm room and then left harvard it's you know it, it doesn't start with bill gates but it's a modern reference for that it calls all the way to Mark Zuckerberg, like my idea is way bigger than what's happening at this university type of thing. I remember these are kids of privilege, right? I mean, Bill Gates, for as amazing as he was, like grew up in a very affluent family. His father was a prominent lawyer in Seattle. Um, taking a risk in that environment is much harder than coming from the countryside into a city you don't know yeah. really well, building a business from scratch and then selling it and then just out like out executing everybody else along the way and yeah you're right i think by having a life that's filled with varied experiences in different towns and in different countries makes you more resilient and i Mm -hmm. I agree with you i love those stories more right like i love sergey brin and the founding story of google but let's be fair they were in a computer science program at stanford basically in the belly of silicon valley now what they did was super innovative and stuff but it would have been weirder if they hadn't done something i think yeah. And remember, his parents were probably also, and I'm making this up because I don't know, we could look it up, but his parents were probably also nuclear physicists or very well educated people. He went to a Montessori school. Like, you know, he was, Bruce. if anybody was going to do this, he was going to do it. He was definitely, pretty, he would tell you that too. Hmm. But I kind of gravitate more to the stories of, wow, I can't believe you did that. Like, that's right. amazing. Because the fact that you did it was so unlikely. And the fact that you continue to do it is so unlikely is a much more interesting and compelling story to me. He was Agreed. a mathematician, his dad, apparently. Yeah, okay. No, no, his... Not a Nobel Prize winner, but, you know. <laughs> I, I think you know, you're right, isn't it? It's kind of like, I mean, it's not a risky environment. They almost were just following the footsteps, but probably doing a lot better, right? And you talk about yeah. Gates and Zuckerberg. There's not a, there wasn't a lot of risk in that because they, they, they could take risk, but within very safe parameters, couldn't they? Well, sure, because if Zuckerberg had failed, you know, I'm sure his, here's the phone call, right? You, and I'm guessing, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm surmising, right? But like, you get wherever his family is from, he calls. He's like, "Mom, look, I'm uh, Harvard's great and everything, and I know I tried really hard in high school, and you've been really proud of me, but I'm, I'm getting out of this clam bank and going to Silicon Valley because I got this thing called the Facebook, and it's, and he's like, "Mom, are you there? <laughs> Mom, you know, because." These parents don't want their kids to quit, and they don't know it's going to turn into a $100 billion company. Yeah. Honey, can you just finish school first? Kind of thing, right? But in his but mind, though, if it, he, he, you know, if I can do this thing. If it goes belly up, well, I've still got Harvard. That's the point, though. Right. Right, that's the point. And, and kudos. Believe, don't, don't get me wrong, and I think you'll agree with me on this. I'm not minimizing anything that these people have done. What they've built is insanely good, right, and insanely powerful and very successful. But the environment into which they built it was kind of begging for them to do it, right? Because, like, again, if I had failed, I had no safety net. And maybe that's why I find these stories so compelling. Like, I had to succeed because I had no way to go back to something that was going to support me if I didn't do it. Right. But again, people don't know that because they see who I am today and just think I've always been like this, whatever like this is. But we know the background stories for these other people. And this is, again, one of the reasons why I find these female stories so interesting is because at some level the cards are stacked against them right yeah yeah well i find it interesting as well that this you talk about storytelling i find it fascinating this whole idea of the stories that we tell about ourselves and also the stories that other people tell you know the stories we tell to other people as well so you know if you're a woman and this is what we haven't put up to to the same degree we will never will experience it but you know if you're a woman you know you will never have that that story or that that conversation where there's a kind of expectation that now we've got to have a family 
now we've got to quit our jobs to look after the family or yep. this isn't what a woman of your age should be doing you know right. do, okay we get that with men i mean you know middle age us middle-aged men do stupid things right which you know yep fair enough kind of embarrass our kids and stuff like that but you know that's cool yeah. but you know for a woman to do these kind of things like to take risk that's not what women do you know that starts no. with you know i know you probably experienced this pressure with your daughter as well you know growing up it's like give her pink things you know give her things that aren't gonna let her take lots of risks things you know not not square brick like things which you can build things with you know give her the sort of the soft dolly type things right it starts at a young age so it's a very powerful but seemingly innocuous thing but it shapes all of these women they haven't had to now we we will never know what that is right i mean we'll never know the true weight of those expectations no no and really what i want to do and we can talk about this later under separate cover but what i want to do is I want to take this platform, right, and make sure that going forward that this conversation is happening between other women and that's getting broadcast. I think that's really powerful and very compelling as well. And we can talk about that later. But I agree with you. In the same way that we have a platform to tell stories and that those stories are really important, right, every group should have that platform. And And I think, you know, women themselves should be able to have that platform as well to do it. What do you just finishing up then on that? What, what do you think the the biggest challenge in all of this is, Michael, for, for female entrepreneurs? I mean, there's the obvious thing that, well, there's discrimination abound, right? But probably not in the form that's obvious, right? No, no, it's very subtle, right? But what what do you think the biggest challenge is for female entrepreneurs today? If we if we could fix one thing as as a, a you know, an aggregate mass of entrepreneurs, what would it be? Where is the where's the sort of the quick wins here? So I want to, and this is a really risky thing to say, right? But like when Doug Williams was the quarterback of the Washington Redskins in the eighties, right? They, you know, they, the, the media focused a lot on him being a black quarterback because back then that was revolutionary. And he said what Alexis said, he's like, when people stop talking about me as a black quarterback and just start talking about me as a quarterback, I'll know that I've had impact. Yeah. And I think what Alexis said back in 2013 still rings really true to me. And I'll add one thing to it. So first is when we stop talking about, you know, like you're not a male podcaster, you're just yeah. podcasting. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? When, when people stop saying like she's a female, you know, CEO or whatever, when people stop talking about that, then I think we've made the right level of progress. Um, but how do you but, talk about that without... I mean, how do we talk about this subject without reconfirming the stereotype? I mean, that's the... Well, we can't. But the fact that we're still talking about it means that we're not there yet. And that's actually right. okay. Right, that's gotcha, actually okay. Gotcha. But the second thing we have to do is we have to take, right, you know, we have to take this generation of women and just say, you know what? It's not just that you get the same rights or the same opportunities as a man. It's just that anything you want to do is okay. You can be or do anything. Yeah. And if that means nothing... That's okay. You can just go sit on a beach and be a bartender just like Tom Cruise did in that movie. <laughs> or, or you can run General Electric or Pepsi yeah. just like a woman does today. Like all those outcomes are okay. And any choice that you see, a man never has to make the choice of having a baby or not. It's not yeah. fair. Um, it does impact things. You can't argue about that. That's just a fact. But within the context of having to make some of those choices, any of those choices are okay. And even actually one of the women at the table said this morning at breakfast, she's like, I made the decision to be a housewife. Yeah. That's her words, not mine. And she said, and that didn't work. <laughs> wow. But it needs to be accept but both of those outcomes need to be acceptable and not no one needs to be judgmental about either one of them. And I think that's both of those things have to happen. Where when your daughter says to you, you know, I want to be I want to be a neurosurgeon, you're just like, Yep. Fine. Go into medicine. But but again, but it's it's okay for it to be acceptable inside the family. That's actually the easy part. The hard part is yeah. in society when your friends come over and say, your daughter's studying biology and, and biochemistry in college. Why? What's yeah. she going to do? Like, that's silly. What a waste. And you're yeah, like, yeah. that's the thing you have to fight against, right? Because internally, you know, and my daughter knows this, doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Like, if it makes you happy and it's not illegal, you should try it, right? Um, whether that's learning something or a profession or anything. Yeah. Um, and but again, it's externally, sorry. And going back to, I mean, sort of circling back on the part of the beginning of the conversation, I think, you know, for people like that is that if you're surrounded by people who don't get it, 
then change the people you hang around with. And that's exactly you go back to the Bangkok breakfast club, right? You know, it's kind of, that's what it's about, isn't it? You know, if you surround yourself with the right people, you can choose the people you hang around with. And those people you hang around with shape those kind of expectations. Absolutely. Absolutely. You you create your own ecosystem and you create your own environment. And if you fill that ecosystem with people that are not necessarily only like-minded, but that are accepting, right? It's more important, right? Who was it? I was listening to somebody else talk today and they said, you know, when Coldplay was getting to be really famous, the lead singer of Coldplay said to, um, said to Bono, like, give me some advice. Like if I get really famous and really successful, give me some advice. Just what's the, your big piece of advice? And he said, if you're out to dinner and all of the people are on your payroll all the time, you've just turned into a dick. <laughs> and the point was, and the point was like, it's not good to surround yourself with yes men. That's not what I'm yeah. espousing, and I don't think you are either. But the point is, you should surround yourself with people that are accepting, that will give you like constructive criticism, but that will accept the choices that you make, and that any of them are okay. Well, it's the smartest person in the room again, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, if you're surrounded by yes men. Hey, you know, I don't know if the, you probably know the story better than me, but maybe people could tweet us if they know. I remember reading, I know half the story. There's a Thai lady. She won the gold in weightlifting at the Rio Olympics. And uh, she'd been trying for many years to win, but without success. And she, when asked when, why she was successful this time around, she said, because she changed her name. And they said, why? You know, because I think it was the foreign press had asked her, right? Said, well, you know, being a failure, she went bankrupt when she was younger. And she said, being a failure as a woman in Thailand or in Asia was so much of a burden that it chased me everywhere. Wow. So I'd like to know the full story. If anybody knows that, please let us know because it sounds fascinating, right? And she's, yeah, I'll look the it up fact she's changed her name was the, the reason we should successful, right? Yeah. Wow. We're speechless after that. I am. I don't know what to say after that. Wow. Wow. <laughs> well, that's the been, only response. Exactly. That's been a great conversation today. I really loved it. I'm really charged. I'm so glad you brought this up, Michael. And you, you, these yeah. people that you're meeting are just fantastic. And they to fabulous. share the stories. I feel privileged to be able to sit here and listen to them. Yeah, I can't wait. So I've got, and again, not, not to get too inside baseball, but I've got a meeting with Nikki again tomorrow. And I just want to like do anything I can to encourage her and to help her build this into something much bigger, right? Where, you know, like, in my mind, the end of everything is how, can, how she can sort of not just empower people, but how she can invest in people both like emotionally and with money. How can she raise money to help all the people that she thinks of all the women that she meets that she's trying to empower? It would be great if she could allocate funds to them to help them build and accelerate the building of their business. You know, there was a woman at the table today, again, not to get too, too detailed, but like she had started three businesses in the last year just testing. So she had, you know, not the resources, but the time and the inclination to say, I think this will work. I think that'll work. I think this will work. And I'm happy to try all of them. Mm. It's just great to watch. But if she wants to scale it, and again, just like Blair, and I'll talk to Blair about this on Thursday, how are you going to scale and how are you going to fund that scaling? Right? And I'd love for Nikki to be the one having that conversation saying, look, I raised a $5 million seed fund. Um, and, you know, for whatever money that I give you, I'll take 7% of that business. Just do what other venture capitalists do or other high net worth individual investors do and start seeding businesses, right? And she can seed male and female. It doesn't matter to me, but you know, yeah. if her bias is to, and here's the other thing too, right? I just use the word bias, right? But if her bias is to fund females only, you will have a small group of men saying, Hey, that's not fair. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and my response to them is too bad. Too bad. You've had your time. Well, cause 97% of the venture capitalists, at least in the United States are on the partner level are men. Yeah. Maybe that's a ghost stat, but I'm sure it's close to that. Yeah. So let's let's try to flip that around a little bit. Well, it's great. I really enjoyed the the content today. Yeah, and so we'll do. I. Do you want to do a second part of this? You want to do another? I follow-up? do. I do because I I've left some people out, and I think there are more stories to tell and more interesting yeah. businesses to talk about. So I think let's just do what we did with the autonomous vehicles. Let's end here. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a good place to end, and then let's talk about a few more ladies. Um, next week. Happy to do it. And I've got plenty to talk about, about them as well. Different stories, different journeys. Um, you know, but I've got at least four more people that I want to talk about. And there are plenty more behind that. These are just the four that I've kind of highlighted to myself. So yeah, exactly. And if you're listening and you, you know, awesome stories, 
similar kind of vein to the kind of thing we talked about you know female founders who are doing great things not by virtue of being a female but just you know doing great things in business then tweet us right how can people get in touch so people can get in touch with me on twitter at at michael waits just my full name and always use the hashtag asia tech podcast um that's the best way to get us you can email me at michael.waits at gmail.com i'm happy to take any feedback yeah asiatechpodcast.com iTunes YouTube everywhere everywhere we'll see you next week thanks Graham you've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com